So tonight is, is really exciting for me to share with you a little bit about research that I've been engaged in for about seven years now, examining faith-based uh, community muralism in the city of Philadelphia, uh, where, I, where I grew up and where all of my, my family roots, all of my family came from Ireland directly to Philadelphia, and most of my family still lives in Philadelphia. And I'd like to talk to you about the way that this art has not only transformed Philadelphia into the mural capital of the world, but it has also uh, turned this city of brotherly love, which is kind of the moniker for Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, into a city of just love. You know, there's a particular kind of love, I think, that this, this mural movement is evoking from citizens of Philadelphia. And I'd also like to explore with you parallels between Philadelphia's history as a post-industrial American city with a huge economic gap uh, between the city and the suburbs, racial tensions and questions about the future of development and gentrification, and the historical and contemporary circumstances of Melbourne, uh, some of which I would imagine there are some parallels there, and to explore that via public art. And I've been exposed to a bit of the very vibrant public art scene that you have in the city, and I'm going to do more of that um, on Sunday. And I'm hoping also to be able to, um, in doing this, exploring some of this art, um, we might all become more attentive to what community art is doing, um, both in Philadelphia and in Melbourne, in helping us see uh, the, the call of justice and uh, the, the imperative of social justice. So here's what I'm going to do with you in my time this evening. I want to share a little bit about what brought me to this project. Um, and also how muralism works. Community muralism is a distinct form of public art. I want to talk with you a little bit about that. And then I also want to explain a few things, four things actually in particular, that I've learned, four theological insights really that I've gained about the intersection of religion, the art, and social change in post-industrial cities like Philadelphia, um, where I grew up, and like New York, where I now live. Um, and then I'll be sure to leave time, as Brother Mark said, for, um, for conversation and conviviality. So, let me begin with a little bit about how I came to this project. Theology is quite simply a discipline defined as faith-seeking understanding. Implied in that definition is the sense that there is wisdom yet to be gained. Not only are the big questions still unanswered, but also there are new questions worth asking. Or, as one of my students put it a few weeks ago on the final exam, there's a lot for us yet to discover about God. What I like about being a theologian is that there are plenty of aha moments still to be had when it comes to our understanding of God or how God relates to us in the created world, and that these ideas about God really do have a big impact. In my experience, I usually encounter these aha moments in really unexpected places when I'm not really looking for them. So they rarely strike me when preparing lectures or <clears throat> reading academic art articles or books. Rather, it's in everyday encounters or places or activities that all of a sudden a light goes off or I see something that's very familiar in an unfamiliar way, almost as if to see it for the first time. And this has been the case for me with murals, the most democratic form of public art. Given the collaborative process that creates them, and the city streets where they are exhibited. In murals, I'm not only finding new answers to timeless theological questions, but perhaps more importantly, I feel as though I'm unearthing, the murals are unearthing new questions. Since murals are sites where all sorts of people who we don't usually hear from in our college classrooms or in our political debates or in our economic forecasting are engaged in a visual discourse, and a visual discourse that's very difficult to ignore. So now, often, when I'm moving through the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, and particularly when I do so in a 15-passenger van stamped with Fordham emblems and filled with undergraduates, I try to become a religious pilgrim on a spiritual quest. I try to move through these neighborhoods with a heightened awareness of what's going on around me and with a willingness to have something about me be profoundly changed by what I encounter along the way. And the murals serve as markers or sacred spaces along my journeying that reveal something new or unexpected. 
They are places where theophany happens, or the extraordinary grandeur of God somehow manages to break through the ordinariness of my everyday experience. I've discovered that once you begin to move through your world with a heightened sense of the pilgrim, aware of what you see, what you hear, what you smell, the sensations on your skin and in your heart, you can become more attentive to what's going on in your immediate surroundings and open yourself up to new ways of responding. In fact, I've already gone on a bit of a pilgrimage uh, through Melbourne, and I have a couple images that I could share with you um, at the end. Um, some great images of public art here in your city. This leads me to the second thing I enjoy about being a theologian, and that's the ability to use my intellectual gifts to follow through on my deeply held conviction that the Catholic tradition can be liberating for all people, regardless of gender, race, religion, sexual orientation, age, the list could go on and on. Engaging community murals in Philadelphia and other cities around the country has only strengthened me in my resolve and provided the medium or the canvas or the images and colors to explain that sense of liberation more effectively. For example, through my work with the murals, I've actually delved more deeply into my own family's history in some of the neighborhoods in Philadelphia where this art is exhibited, and therefore my connection to folks who are now trying to liberate themselves from the structural poverty that resulted from dispositions and choices of my great-grandparents and grandparents when it came to their decision like many other working and middle class whites, to leave the city, the city of Philadelphia and invest in the suburbs instead. This knowledge has allowed me to see my own story as a suburbanite more accurately and continues to liberate me from a sense of moral innocence where racism is concerned, something that really only gets in the way of being an effective ally of people of color. Encountering these murals, speaking with people who create them, becoming aware of the Catholic Church's history in these neighborhoods, often not for the better, has helped me to rethink how familiar Catholic concepts like human dignity, subsidiarity, or the common good might be effectively applied to the lived reality of residents of cities like Philadelphia. We, when we consider ways people in these places actually live these ideas in their relationships with each other, relationships that make this amazing art possible. So the murals have helped me to hold on to the Catholic tradition and to hold it more accountable to forgotten or ignored people. And this can release the tradition from the grip of people who have been in positions of power or influence in the church over the past few generations. And I suspect that folks here in Australia feel that similar need for an increased sense of accountability. So, with all of that said, let me tell you a little bit about what muralism is and what makes the 3,700 images, mural images in the city of Philadelphia so different from other murals that you might have encountered in your own, in your own wanderings. And that has to do about the history of, this, of, the, of muralism, the process of muralism, and the context. So I'll say a couple things about each of those and then move into these aha moments. So in terms, of the, in terms of the history, Philadelphia's cultural status as the mural capital of the world has been 27 years in the making, thanks to the city's mural arts program, which started in the early 80s as an anti-graffiti initiative that sought to offer amnesty to graffiti taggers who were willing to cover their tags with images they learned how to paint in muralism classes. The painting was contagious, and soon neighborhoods were getting in on the act using canvases of walls in front of open lots. In prison yards. With overpasses. In parking lots. bus depots, halfway houses, warehouses, and all of these different places in order to bring beauty into their communities. 
Muralism has since evolved in Philadelphia from simply painting some aspect of the community's cultural identity, perhaps we can look at this one, <clears throat> to working with communities to expand their self-understandings by putting them in dialogue with others, captured here in an interfaith mural, uh, invoking the word justice in three different faith traditions, to engaging particular issues that are impacting the city and also incorporating other artistic media into wall painting. So for example, on this mural, um, there's a, um, um, a transmitter, and when you drive by and your radio is tuned to a certain station, you can hear an oral history that was done um, in conjunction with painting this mural. So you can hear stories of people in the neighborhood as you, as you drive by or as you walk by. However, in its, in its 27 years in Philadelphia, the mural, program, mural arts program has not strayed from its roots and continues to work with marginalized populations throughout the city, most notably at, use, at risk youth and neighborhoods dealing with the structural violence of concentrated poverty. Unlike traditional forms of public art that are commissioned by private interests or civic authorities with little connection to the heavily traveled public spaces in which they are exhibited, Community murals arise from the everyday experiences of largely unheard populations and are commissioned by persons with little access to institutional art or opportunities to contribute to cultural definitions of beauty. That's a very distinct difference. That this art is displayed on concrete canvases and places dislocated from the common good is not a coincidence, but often the very condition for unleashing the transformative power of these images and their prophetic content on inner city and suburban residents alike. Since the memories, emotions, and imaginations of community members are the muse and the material for this art, these persons become the privileged insiders and experts who explain the significance of their murals to the wider community. This aesthetic preferential option for the poor, as I've come to see it, as well as the relationship building process of community muralism empowers people whose capacity for imaginative expression and creativity has been diminished by concentrated poverty and who also have been misrepresented in the arts or denied meaningful access to humanly made or natural beauty. So let me say a little bit about the process. Mural making is an elaborate process that creates meaningful relationships as well as spectacular art. It begins when representatives from a community submit an application to the Mural Arts Program, and the Mural Arts Program gets about 300 applications a year. In addition to identifying a potential wall and a tentative theme, the folks in the neighborhood have to secure 30 signatures from neighbors who agree to participate in some way in the process. So the fundamentals of community organizing are built into this process. The Mural Arts Program, a clearinghouse for more than 150 muralists, as well as private and public funding for the arts, then identifies a muralist whose personal and artistic sensibilities seem to be the right fit for the project. The muralists and the community members come together for at least three meetings, where there have to be at least 12 neighbors present. In some cases, these meetings gather together disparate members of civil society who imagine, design, and paint together. And here are just a few examples of these disparate groups. So police officers and inner city youth, Muslims, Christians, and Jews, recent immigrants from West Africa and their new African-American neighbors, incarcerated felons and victims of crime, evangelical Christians and ex-offenders, delinquent juveniles and neighbors impacted by crime, or black teenagers and white suburban adults, just a sampling. The muralist listens to community members and integrates their collective imaginings into a design which desires a consensus 
from neighbors before uh, painting begins. So the process of building consensus um, is really critical and uh, the Mural Arts Program has walked away from programs where neighbors could not you know, arrive by consensus. And at the end, the muralist is beholden to, uh, to the neighbors, right? that they're the ones who have the final say, the final approval. So there are lots of, um, lots of sending uh, muralists back to the drawing board and representing to the community. So again, this is empowering um, and recognizing the inherent creative power within the community. The muralist creates a paint-by-number matrix on six-by-four sheets of parachute paper, which are eventually adhered to the wall once painting is completed. This way, the mural can be painted in multiple locations at the same time, so you can have prisoners in uh, the largest uh, maximum security prison in Pennsylvania, the fifth largest in the country, working on the same mural as folks in the, in the church basement and uh, kids in the uh, public school system. So you can have multiple people working on a project at the same time. Through community meetings, painting days, and dedication ceremonies, the grassroots process of mural making gradually weaves back together communities torn apart by violence, mass incarceration, and addiction. Furthermore, by pulling in various groups that make up civil society into this creative, into this creative process, the police department, the Department of Corrections, healthcare providers, the public school district, faith-based organizations, social service agencies, the murals create what I call a common beauty that is both artistic, relational, and restorative. So let me say just a word or two about the context. Again, the third kind of component that makes community muralism in Philadelphia different than uh, muralism movements in other parts of the, of the U.S. and around the world. Much of the art in one of the much of the art in one of the world's largest public galleries is exhibited in the U.S. fifth largest city, where 25% of the residents live below the poverty line, where unemployment hovers at 11%. That's the official um, the official number. Although about 40% of the population is really not in the labor force at all, and the median house median in, in median household income is 37,000 a year. But that's the medium of all of these different, um, all of these different um, census districts in the city, and you can see that it's um, not necessarily representative. More importantly, the vast majority of this art resides in neighborhoods where the average income is far less than thirty thousand a year, more likely fifteen or twenty, where more than eighty percent of the neighbors are either African American or Hispanic, where more than forty percent live below the poverty line where less than 10% of high school students are likely to go on to college. So in other words, this is art that's being done in marginalized communities. The murals these inner city, inner city citizens create with each other prophetically reveal the human faces of social justice issues facing inner city communities in cities like Philadelphia or Detroit or New York. Um, or Chicago or Baltimore. You can name any post-industrial city in the United States. And some of the things that are facing these communities are culture of violence, escalating rates of incarceration, the d drug industry and addiction, inequities in public services, degradation of the environment, and the tensions of racism and multiculturalism. Perhaps more importantly, they reveal these neighbors' refusal to submit to socioeconomic conditions that dehumanize them, and also suburban attitudes that diminish or ignore them. Murals reclaim literal and figurative spaces in the midst of the neighborhood for people to come together to identify, express, and remember their communal identity. Painted walls transform otherwise mundane urban places into storied spaces that defy the binary thinking that sustains concentrated poverty. And by binary thinking, I'm talking black, white, rich, poor, native, immigrant, Christian, non-Christian, tax paying, welfare receiving, all of these binaries that really shape American public discourse around poverty. They transform these, or they challenge these with a transformative power that comes with seeing an all too familiar reality like urban poverty in a completely different way. Whether via the complexities of history told from different perspectives, 
the ambiguity of multiple interpretations of similar or the same historical events or conditions, or the insights of emotions or creative intuitions. I focus on murals that are created by faith communities, churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, or those that contain religious imagery. The Mural Arts Program receives, as I said, about 300 applications a year, and at least a third of those applications come from faith communities. So there's a real desire for this kind of art among faith-based groups in the city. So returning to the title of my presentation and the focal point for the remainder of it, I think murals tell us something about justice or how we can go about living in right relationship with each other. And I want to make four, um, four observations about that. Um, so you can breathe easy. I'm not going to commence a slideshow showing all 3,700 uh, images, although I think you find that pretty fantastic. Um, but I just want to alert you to some, some of the aha moments, right? So one of the first things that I've kind of come to recognize or, or explore a little bit more in depth theologically is the sense of the sacred uh, erupting, emerging, blossoming um, in the midst of the urban profane. Religion and politics are often frenemies at best, particularly in the United States, and particularly in election seasons, which we in the United States seem to be perpetually in. Religion too easily becomes shrill and fundamentalist and rightly dismissed by our secular culture, which at least in the United States is statistically growing in number. 20% of Americans now identify themselves as unaffiliated with religion. And that number actually goes up to 30% when you consider millennials, uh, folks born um, between 1982 and um, 1997. It's also seen, religion is also seen as something that gets in the way of clear thinking about social problems. And then on the flip side, religious believers too easily dismiss the growing number of people who choose to be unaffiliated with religion and religious institutions as somehow lacking moral values or being selfish individualists. But in Philadelphia, we have many examples of religious expression contributing in healthy ways to our public discourse about political issues. And these contributions are made without words, but rather with images. And this makes it possible to get past the baggage that everyone brings to these conversations because you have to engage in this discourse in a very different way. Not with ideology, but with imagination. Not with a what's in it for me or us attitude, but what's in it for everybody. Not as a debate to be won, but as a dialogue to be shared. Not with grandstanding, but with consensus building. These are all very different aptitudes uh, that murals cultivate. These are skills that we need in our religious communities and in our civic communities as well if we're going to get anywhere in addressing real problems facing our neighbors in places like inner city Philadelphia. Because they stand at the intersection of religion and politics, as you can see in this mural done by truant high school students wanting to address religiously motivated hate, mural making can offer new ways of being religious and being political, or ideally both at the same time. Because they are a form of art, murals are almost automatically an expression of spirituality. So when we find them in public spaces around the city, they challenge any sense that God is a strictly personal and private affair. Rather, religious imagery on walls echo Jim Wallace, a leading evangelical Christian and public intellectual, who insists that God might be personal, but God is profoundly public. Murals remind us that art and spirituality are about perceiving the more in our reality and trying to express that in some lived or practiced way. It is this sense of the more that can awaken us to a restless dissatisfaction with the way things are, or make us less willing to accept that this is as good as it gets, or it will get for others. The more suggests to all of us that new things are indeed possible, that God does indeed continue to disclose God's self to us in unexpected ways and continuously calls us to build community in more loving and just ways. So many images in Philadelphia's murals point to that sense of the more, and they share common themes about the sacred, or communicate some important things about what God is up to in urban spaces. For example, encountering the sacred is about telling and participating in shared stories of struggle and triumph, particularly around the immigration experience 
whether voluntary or involuntary, or the process of assimilation into the dominant culture. Murals offer ways for faith communities to articulate how they understand the Abrahamic command to love our neighbor, or even what it means to be neighbor, captured in this image done by a Jewish community center that visually explains the 69 mitzvahs of the, of the Torah, captured in the, the image of the pomegranate, which is a sacred uh, image in Judaism. And they reveal that religious diversity, and not just religious singularity, is the greatest ally against social and economic forces that divide and segregate people in cities today in the United States. They wordlessly proclaim, why go it alone when you can walk, march together towards justice? Again, captured in this image, um, done by the um, Neighborhood Interfaith Movement in a, in a very progressive and racially and economically integrated uh, city or uh, neighborhood in Philadelphia. So thanks to the murals, Philadelphians don't need to enter sacred spaces to hear the stories of their faith traditions or be reminded of their central moral codes to love their neighbors. And because so many of these explicitly religious murals communicate common desires and dreams that all people share, they reach beyond the parameters of their particular faith traditions in order to call out to all citizens, regardless of denomination or affiliation. So I think that's very significant. And there's just a little bit of the detail of the windows capturing the distinctiveness of different faith traditions that participate in the neighborhood interfaith movement. A second theological aha or epiphany for me in this work is the way in which it invites uh, folks to be thinking and doing justice outside of the box, to get outside of the box, think outside of the box. Um, those of us in the academy, at least, who are concerned with justice tend to think of justice with our heads, with our intellects. This is particularly true in the Catholic tradition, which has long taught that justice is something we know by our commonly shared capacity for reason. But really, when we pay attention to the story side of our faith tradition, biblical stories of Yahweh's action on behalf of the people of Israel, Jesus' parables with parables about the kingdom of God, stories of the lives of saintly people like Francis of Assisi or Mary McKellop or Dorothy Day, we realize that justice is really a matter of the heart. It has to be something that moves us, a vision that grabs a hold of us and won't let go, something that gets stuck in our crawl. Murals have helped me remember this and to do justice work with my heart and with my body, which gives home to my heart and not just my mind. <coughs> painting, after all, is something that involves the body. A mural painting literally brings body into bodies into contact with other bodies. But in many ways, Philadelphia mural, Philadelphia's mural art program captures this more affective and embodied dimension of justice in their mission statement, I'm going to quote them. What we do is deceptively complex. What drives us is the opportunity to help life triumph over the forces of despair. We just happen to be good at painting murals. When faith communities paint murals, they assist members of the community in telling transformative stories, stories that can help their congregation their neighborhoods, indeed the entire city, to think outside the box about entrenched social problems like racism, like truancy, like religiously motivated discrimination, like the impasse of mass incarceration. <coughs> I think in these murals we get a glimpse of what justice outside the box calls for. It's really rare to change people's minds about something they have strong convictions about. And so justice that starts from that place, trying to change people's minds, will probably not get too far. Much of our ability to work collectively with people outside of our respective affinity groups, be that our faith community or parish, our political party, our gender, our racial group, is that we have a hard time letting go of the convictions of our own groups. But if we can change people's <coughs> perceptions, maybe not their minds, but their perceptions about an issue or a dilemma, change the angle from which they engage it, then we're on to something, and new ways forward begin to take shape. Change perception, and then you can change the way that people engage. Murals are interrupting the way Philadelphians see things, and this is making a big difference, particularly the way we respond to crime and punishment in Philadelphia. 
Um, so Philadelphia is the eighth most violent city uh, in the country as of 2011. It's estimated that on any given day in this country, in the or in this country, in the United States, excuse me, in the United States, 2.2 million Americans are incarcerated and seven million more await sentencing or are on probation. In 2008, the United States hit a disturbing milestone. Despite the fact that violent crime has dropped 25% in the last 20 years, one in 100 American adults is now in prison, and one in 31 is in some way involved in the criminal justice system. In fact, the Justice Policy Institute reported that in April of 2008, Philadelphia, the first city to build a modern prison in 1829, had the highest incarceration rate of any county in the country. On an average day in 2011, there were 8,274 folks in Philadelphia's jails, and experts know that a vast majority of them are persons of color. So, the prison industrial complex, I'm not sure if that would be something that you all in Australia would be familiar with, but it's a $55 billion a year industry that is really driving um, America um, consciousness around crime and punishment. The work that the Mural Arts Program is doing in jails, in juvenile detention centers and prisons, which has created more than 30 murals inside some uh, jails in the city, but also in communities on the outside, break through the seemingly inescapable impasse of mass incarceration by offering ways of thinking about criminal justice and forgiveness, and perhaps most importantly, the relationship between uh, criminal justice and forgiveness. It's inviting people to think outside the box when it comes to, um, when it comes to criminal justice. So making, uh, mural making in, det in detention centers and jails and prisons involves months of conversation and reflection before participants even pick up a brush. And this is a, this is a community meeting that I was fortunate enough to attend inside Greaterford Prison, which is the largest, again, the largest maximum security prison um, in Pennsylvania. And it was a meeting to hash out um, the plan for the mural uh, that was painted on this wall connected to this church here, which is the Bible Way Baptist Church. And so at that meeting were representatives from the um, representatives from the from the church, uh, muralists, and then around the table um, were men who were incarcerated for life, but who were working to design this, this image. So the resulting image, and here's an example again, a great um, photograph from that. Let's go back to look at the resulting image. This an image like this, like from behind the mask, reminds us that authentic forgiveness begins with a difficult, messy, and unpredictable, unpredictable process of reestablishing relationships with the self and others, and even the divine, that are sever severed by crime. These nonverbal expressions have the potential to set perpetrators free from their guilt and victims from their hurt. Given that the mural arts program works each year with 300 adults and 200 juveniles involved in, in the criminal justice system from detention to parole, um, may well attribute to the fact that the number of citizens incarcerated in 2011 was actually the lowest in five years, even though it still um, was a high watermark um, nationally. Moreover, these larger than life images literally help Philadelphians um, help the Philadelphia metropolitan area see the bigger picture when it comes to crime and punishment. Broken societies give rise to broken people who are unable to recognize the humanity in themselves and in others, something that art actually does recognize. We can reduce crime and recidivism by recognizing the inherent dignity in all persons and building communities with the essentials that people need to flourish, education, employment, health care, access to the arts, and recreation. Justice has to be about seeing the big picture and feeling it as well. We need to get, an, we need to get emotional about figuring out how to build more equitable and safe and healthy communities and neighbors. And many of the murals that contain religious imagery, like this one, are visual expressions of lament. Laments are expressions of, of profound faith. 
The depth of emotion laments, laments convey can only arise from stark experiences of being separated from God and yearning for reunion. Laments arise from people with a special capacity to, for God, often due to their socioeconomic status. Consider, for example, the fervent laments of the people of Israel during their bondage in Egypt, or the various people in the New Testament who called out to Christ to be healed. Barbara Smolin's contemporary Pieta, and the families are victims too, captures this sense of lament. And she's a Jewish muralist who said after hearing the stories of families in this neighborhood who wanted a mural to really commemorate their sense of loss and their sense of pain, the Pieta was really one of the only images that was available to her uh, to really perhaps capture that visually. Here, families visually grieve the loss of a loved one to gun violence and refuse to be consoled knowing that their visual cries painted on this bus terminal bear witness to the fact that something is fundamentally wrong with the violence in our culture, a violence that is not limited only to inner cities and is driven by shareholders in the firearms and prison industries. Because they call attention to the stark contrast between the way things are and the way things could or should be, in some ways captured by this grieving, um, grieving angel. And this is a woman who is very influential in putting together a support group in her neighborhood. Her name is Sandy Spicer, um, who started this organization called The Families Are Victims Too. Because um, it creates this contrast between the way things are and the way things could be, laments name a people's unfulfilled aspirations and prophetically refuse to let the dreams of the future be extinguished. In short, they embody hope, especially since laments are not only directed to God, but directed to others. So murals that capture this notion of lament summon the wider community to take seriously the suffering of the present and to participate in this kind of longing for a different future. All of these are very important emotions that need to be um, unearthed and harnessed in order for justice outside of the box really um, to be possible. I also think that this art is doing a really good job in helping us think through the, the symbol of the ghetto, or the notion of the ghetto. Now I realize that's probably, maybe it's not a distinctively American concept or idea. Maybe that could be something to, to discuss um, in conversation. Um, but with the help of the art, spirituality can become about removing masks that keep us from either really seeing what's going on around us, or that keep us from really showing others who we are. And, this, and so in this way, they are particularly helpful in removing the various masks of the ghetto. Murals make us aware of the way that the ghetto is a socially constructed symbol in the United States, which functions in a detrimental way in our public consciousness, and which negatively impacts citizens who live in ghettos. In other words, ghettos have roots in the dispositions and attitudes of people who live outside of them. Dispositions and attitudes of suspicion, fear, rejection, ignorance, and internalized superiority that span generations, and then in turn influence the personal stance that outsiders take towards folks in our inner cities, or our collective decision not to distribute resources essential for communities to flourish. These attitudes and practices that arise from them Voluntary segregation, for example, in the suburbs and suburban schools, law enforcement strategies of racial profiling and stop and frisk, changes in voter registration policies and voting itself, zoning laws, hiring and leasing practices, all of this reinforce a sense of white superiority, which for me is captured by the, the, the eyes of the white woman um, here among these three sets of eyes and all joined hands. They, it reinforces a sense of white superiority that fuels structural racism and therefore concentrated poverty. These murals should present a particular challenge to people of faith, particularly people in Abrahamic traditions, where a loving God requires that we love neighbors in the metaphorical ghettos of biblical literature, among the aliens or widows, among the Samaritans or the lepers, among the taxpayers or the faithful centurions. But as I said, murals do the necessary work of helping suburbanites remove our masks and acknowledge the way in which our own white racial identity impacts the way we perceive ourselves and others, and ways in which we respond to folks of color in our cities. 
They make us see not only the injustices in these neighborhoods, but also the resilience and the wisdom and the creativity and the energy of folks who live there. All attributes which can challenge white complicity and white apathy. Narratives offer an alter or excuse me, murals offer an alternative narrative, one that challenges the myth that we hear about poor people in the United States or poor people of color from so many sources every day. And then murals ask outsiders why we should be so surprised that this creativity, that these resources, that the spirit exists in these neighborhoods. In other words, murals confront us with our own prejudices and invite us, and when I say whites, I'm talking, or when I say us, I'm, I'm really talking about white Americans and white Christians in particular, to take a second look and rethink our dispositions and attitudes. Their process is one of relationship building within communities struggling to get out from under the dominant culture's estimation of them and across boundaries that otherwise keep people separated. And this process demands that you take the risk to truly express yourself, your sense of who you are, as opposed to ideas that people might have about you, your dreams of the future. Also, along the way, disarming yourself by examining prejudices that you might bring with you, and taking the risk to become vulnerable to whatever and whomever you might encounter. These are actually very scary things um, for whites. Uh, to take on, and in fact, I can tell in our question and answer uh, session maybe a story of a failed uh, mural project in a very affluent neighborhood uh, in the city, which I think speaks to some of this. Okay, one last point. In today's cities in America, and I suspect also here in Australia, given some of the conversations that I've been able to have over the last couple uh, the last couple weeks here, we see a perennial question being asked in new ways. What does it mean to be an American? Perhaps for you, what does it mean to be an Australian? Who gets to be an American? Who gets to be an Australian? This is particularly true in cities like Philadelphia, which have experienced an increase in population in the last decade due to an influx of Asian and Hispanic immigrants and a shrinking white uh, population. Murals reveal that faith traditions can offer answers to these questions, particularly by suggesting that interfaith work and multiculturalism is about encounters. Not simply an exchange of ideas or truth claims, but real engagement with shared stories and shared visions and shared feel, and shared, excuse me, fears, and doing this in a very tactile, embodied way. Murals create new space for the sacred in the public square where public theologian Martin Marty says people come to be in each, other's in each other's presence and practice an aggressive hospitality. I love that idea, an aggressive hospitality. Much like that I've experienced here in <laughs> Melbourne. Um, which, unlike tolerance, is willing to take the risk of relationships and vulnerabilities. So this is a really fantastic mural that I think captures this. This is done um, on a Buddhist temple that in its previous, uh, its previous tenants, it was an Italian card club. This neighborhood used to be an Italian-American neighborhood. All the guys would get together and play cards. The Italians have moved out. Um, Mexicans and Vietnamese have, have moved in. Um, and this Buddhist temple wanted to tell the story of the people who arrived to this neighborhood um, in their own immigration experience. And I love this because the muralist told me that as she was doing this, this piece, um, a lot of people had memories of, um, of escaping um, from Vietnam and fleeing on boats and had very vivid sense of what the boat and the water should look like. So she went around and around and around at her community meetings trying to capture the water dressed right in a way that really resonated with people's memories. And so I think these three men are, are kind of assessing, assessing her work on a, on a grand scale there at the end. Um, but they also, the great thing is that you can see this community identify the values that uh, underscore their sense of who they are, but articulated them in three different languages um, with the idea that they wanted to be able to engage um, with a rich and multicultural, um, multicultural community. And so this is the skyline of Philadelphia, and then you can see um, this wanting to communicate. Um, and then it was really great. Here's a, a picture of the dedication ceremony. Um, so some of the monks from the temple came out for this event. This is the councilman, the city councilman, whose father used to play cards in the Italian, uh, in the, in the um, Italian American club there. Um, 
and the, and the muralist is pictured here in the white sunglasses. So really events that you know, those drums and um, and all sorts of really great food that day. So again, trying to embrace multiculturalism. Another good example of this I can show you. Um, this is the Al-Aqsa Islamic Society. Um, has been in the city of Philadelphia for 40 years. Um, there are families, 250 families, representing um, about 20 different uh, nationalities. Um, and after 9-11, they were in a, this old furniture warehouse. You wouldn't even know that they were there. They were very fearful after 9-11 of retaliation. Um, and then they realized that actually they needed to step away from a posture of fear to one of engagement because there were all sorts of people speaking for them and their tradition. And so they engaged in this sort of extreme makeover process. But the interesting thing is that um, the muralist who worked on this um, is a Jew and so and a Catholic. So um, the Catholic uh, woman did a lot of the patterning work. Um, and then um, you can see a great picture of Joe Brennan. Here's Joe working on the scaffolding. And it took a lot of work. They worked for about um, eight months just building up relationships of trust within the mosque among the community and between the community and the muralists before they even started. But as the work unfolded, more and more people in the mosque wanted to get involved, and more and more people in the neighborhood wanted to get involved. So they started rolling um, tiles. Um, they did painting projects with different kids from uh, local schools, from the mosque, from a synagogue up in the suburbs, and a Christian uh, a Catholic school in the city. Um, and the students created these murals. But they also hand-rolled all of these tiles in community painting days. And then the tiles now decorate the entire building. Um, so community members did these with pen caps and paper clips. Um, so it's just a really fantastic, I think, example. And then the 99 names of the law appear in Arabic and in English all around the building. So now when you go on a cultural tour of, of the city of Philadelphia, uh, they will bring you by Alexa because it's really a point of, of pride um, in the city. So it's important to note that communities of faith don't engage in muralism um, for the sake of proselytization or to impart any kind of doctrinal truth. Rather, they serve the wider community by building relationships of trust that are so essential for breaking through the darkness of concentrated poverty. To paint forgiveness, victims and perpetrators need to practice forgiveness. To paint a vision of one's congregation as a door that's open to all requires that congregants be welcoming to all in the community, particularly as offenders. To make one's community a visual presence, one's faith community a visual presence in the wider community, then your group needs to be a visible as needs to be a visible community, as Alaksa selected to do. In this way, civil religion is less about what does it mean to be an American and more about what does it mean to be a good American neighbor. So, in conclusion, in their book on faith and public life, Michael and Kenneth Hines note that the Catholic Christian has always appreciated the vocation of those who go to the desert or the mountaintop, so long as their motive is a love of the city. Philadelphia's faith-based community murals resist the tendencies to retreat from the cares and concerns of urban brothers and sisters by cultivating a creative expression of philia, or neighbor love, that's at the heart of the name of the city. Through community arts such as murals, we come to recognize that justice is a collective vision that arises out of encounters with the mysteries of faith, captured in this case in the fantastic images um, on walls all over the city, that analogically communicate and then seek after relationships with other people. They suggest that a possible way through the emotional impasses of concentrated poverty is not necessarily about doing things differently, but rather bringing people together to imagine things in different ways. In this way, they really are saving the soul of the city. Thank you. We got to change again, just you and me.